All right, hi everyone, welcome. Um, today we're gonna be talking about learning Python like a 12 year old. And I can see that there might be some 12 year olds in the audience, so we're gonna help your parents understand how you learn better so that they can help you learn faster and easier and all of those great things. So we're glad you're here too. But uh, first, we really need to take a selfie. So if you get bored and you start looking at your phone, you can go search us up and tag us and like our photos. Yeah. So everyone wave. Everyone smile. All right. Nice, all right. So, Kelly. So I'm Kelly Schuster Paredes, and I'm a teacher who codes. I work as a computer science teacher at Pinecrest School in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and I am the co-host with uh, Sean here for Teaching Python. And I'm Sean Tiber, and I am now a senior cloud engineer at Mondelez International. We make cookies, not the kind <laughs> that go in your browser, but we make Oreos and Nutter Butters and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, and I'm the other coach, uh, co-host of Teaching Python. But before this, Kelly and I worked together teaching middle school computer science um, to over 1,000 students. OK, so why should you believe us? Besides the fact that I've been with middle school students for about 20-something years, please don't judge, um, we have taught kids to code in Python. We used an iterative approach to making our curriculum. We got to do this four times a year for every grade level. And then we, Sean kept saying, no, we can do better. <laughs> so we've actually taught our courses 50 times plus, and then more than 1,000 kids in the little bit of three years. Yeah, and this is now the way that kids learn is the way we learn ourselves. So we've been learning from our students to be able to learn better, and it really does work. It's really effective. And just a side note, I've only been coding for four years. So today, what we'd like for you to take away as an outcome is we want you to get a peek at the 12-year-old brain, right? No one can fully understand the brain of a 12-year-old, right? But you're gonna get a peek at the way that their brain works and the way that they learn things. Um, that's so that you can learn Python better as an adult. Um, and we want you to have more control over your learning so that it feels like something that you can direct and move through in a way that suits you best, okay? Now, your brain is a little bit different than a 12-year-old's, we hope. Even though you may feel like you're 12 on the inside, right? You I, feel like you're 12 on the inside. All, all the time, <laughs> all the time. Um, a 12-year-old's brain has a lot of neural plasticity, naturally, it just happens. They're designed and wired for learning, right? They really don't have a lot of, uh, a strong sense of risk and risk-taking, like the consequences of that behavior, right? And they're learning broadly all day long. As an adult, like the andragogy, this is the, the science of how adults learn, um, your neuroplasticity is something you have to work for. So you have to be the one making your mind more nimble and making connections, right? You also have a much stronger sense of risk, and there's a lot of other factors that go into the way that you learn differently, right? But what we're gonna do is talk about some things that are really important for 12-year-olds that maybe you forgot about a little bit that you can bring back to your learning and will help you learn in a much more interesting, fun, and effective way. So first and foremost, kids are curious, super curious. I love teaching middle school because every single day there's a why, but how, but can I, but why did you do that, and what can I do more? And it's this constant curiosity that keeps them in this learning phase. And as adults, as you know, we get entrenched. And when we talk about curiosity, we think in a very narrow way, like I'm very curious about this one little thing. We're talking about broad curiosity, right? We're talking about the ways that we think um, about the things that are happening around us and always asking questions and trying to understand. So it's really important to keep in mind that as a 12 year old and us, any learner, the mind is a muscle. And just like going to the gym every day to work out your muscle, you need to work out your brain muscle. It needs to be exercise. And you need to engage it on these multiple levels. You can't just keep working on one side of your brain or the frontal lobe of your brain. You need to work the entire brain. Curiosity is a cognitive skill. It is something that we can learn. It helps us to stimulate um, more learning. It builds purpose in our life and satisfaction in what we're doing. So I always tell my parents, your brain is getting older. You're gonna start forgetting things. So you need to maintain this curiosity as you get older in order to help prevent this cognitive 
decline in your brain and the function. And you know, something that's really important too is using all of your senses to learn, right? We, as programmers and coders, we tend to use a lot of visual cues, right? We are looking at our screens while we're coding. We're, we're feeling the, the keyboard as we're typing, but there are other senses that you can engage. For example, I learn best when I have a hot cup of coffee in my hand. It's, it's the smell of it, it's the warmth, it's the taste of it. It's like a signal to my brain that says, okay, it's learning time, right? So sometimes that gets me in trouble because you know you can't drink coffee at eight o'clock at night and live to tell the tale, right? Then you're up until midnight <laughs> or later. Sometimes you need that as a teacher. So. That's true, that's true. <laughs> so it's important to engage all of your senses. How am I feeling? What, what does this learning experience feel like? Not just what can I see? And so in Python, right, as we're learning Python, the way to hack this is to really question everything. Right? Ask yourself, how does this work? Why does this work? Maybe you can't recursively iterate all the way down to the base of like, you know, the binary that's at, you know, happening on your, on your CPU, but you can ask yourself, why is this part working with this other part? How are these things working together? How do they interact in a new way? Um, you, know, you can also read new code samples. You can look at different, um, different code other than the kind you write all the time. Trey Hunter's talk yesterday, Python oddities explained was a really great example of this because there's a lot of weird things that happen sometimes in Python that you look at and you say, that doesn't make any sense. And so it gets you to be curious about these things. When something unexpected happens, ask why is this happening? How is this happening? That curiosity is really important. And there are books um, like Fluent Python has really great examples of ways to do things differently, more effectively, maybe more Pythonically. Those are all great ways to stretch your curiosity and learn about things because our students don't just ask, did I get it to work? They're asking, why did it work this way? Or is there a different way that I can do this? And that curiosity is really important. And also, I always ask and I, I tell the students, oh, well, why don't you go look at PyPI? Go look at all the, op the other libraries out there. You may not understand them, but it's going to open your eyes to what you can do with Python. And we challenge you to try that too. Go randomly click through the libraries. Yeah, and something that's kind of fun, and we don't think about this because we're always sometimes maybe programmed to think about like, is this the best way? Ask yourself, is there a worse way to do this? Like, what's the way that, that isn't as optimal? Or is there a really bad way of implementing? Because it, it stimulates your brain. Why is it wrong? Why does it um, make things work worse than the way I have it? So a good way to do that sometimes is to go search on GitHub for a package you're using, right? Look through the samples of people using that code in their projects. Is that, are they using it well? Or are they not using it well? Ask yourself those questions. And it's a great way to learn new ways of doing things and stretch your curiosity. So 12 year olds are always learning. They may not be learning what their teachers want them to learn, but they're always learning. They, they're trying everything in a new way. They're challenging um, opportunities in their world. A middle school student has six to eight subjects in a given day, plus sports, plus arts, plus after school reading, plus YouTube, plus Minecraft, plus Fortnite, and I can go on and on. And they're constantly learning how they can improve, how they can play the game better, how they can do something easier, how they can probably get their homework done quicker. Um, and it's, it's rare, though, that they're good at everything all the time but they still keep learning. Okay. And what happens when you keep learning, and I'll put my kids in, in the situation, um, when they're learning, for example, something in Minecraft, or they're trying to, to, to do something in code, it's this feel-good brain hormone that gets released when they do it, and it, it comes back with a reward. This neuroplasticity, this working memory, this muscle workout that they do while they're learning, whether it's with Python or with math or English, it optimizes the brain functions. It helps the movement from the short term to the long term memory and helps them to build more connections. And most importantly, it fosters creativity. And that's something that we want, creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship in our students. So we want them to learn other things, not just Python, not just math, but anything that they can get their hands on to increase that brain activity. And so how to hack your own Python learning. So if you're learning Python as a beginner, if this is the new thing that you're learning, right, make space for focus time 
and diffuse time. So make those moments where you step away for it and you go for a walk or you try something else. Something where you're maybe engaging your hands or other motor skills so that your brain has time to kind of shift into neutral and process everything that it just learned. Okay? But if you're an expert in Python, if you've been coding in Python for a long time, maybe the answer is to learn something new that's not Python. Right? Learn something totally different that makes you uncomfortable, that's new, um, and that you can link back to the things that you already know. So these ideas of connecting concepts and finding things that, that you can take from something new that you're learning to something that you know really well is a proven way to increase the, the cognitive abilities that you have in your brain. It increases creativity, it makes it more fun, it increases your confidence, it's really, really great. And so you can create those connections and build metaphors when you have these outside experiences. Another thing that's really important is to meet people with new perspectives, people who can stimulate your brain in new ways, like at a Python conference <laughs> where you're all here, right? Meet someone new, sit at a new table, ask someone, you know, get curious about what they're, what they're doing and what you can learn from them. And that newness of it is going to stimulate your brain in really interesting ways. I have to say that I've met somebody that was talking about building bridges in Python. Anthony Shaw was trying to convince me that I need to teach binary code. Um, so there's all these really cool things that you can do and, and meet from people. So this one, you've already got a huge step forward. You're here. You're at PyCon. You can meet new people all around you. And it's something that is a great way to jumpstart your learning. But don't sit in front of the TV, right? Don't just sit there and like, absorb content because it doesn't actually help your brain work better. This is something where going for a walk or learning how to knit or do something with your hands, do woodworking, anything that can let your brain kind of idle along and process is what's really gonna help you kind of process all the new things that you're learning. Okay, so this one's my favorite. I know. Well, the next one, yes, go ahead. 12 year olds <laughs> are emotive, right? I don't know if, if you don't know that word, it means that they express emotion. Right? They may not always understand what they're feeling, but they are definitely feeling it. You can sit there and look at a kid learning to code or learning how to figure out something in Python, whether it's how to iterate over a list. You can tell when they're frustrated. You can tell when they're like, uh, I'm, they're determined they're gonna get it. Except right? for these two wonderful girls. We love these girls. And then when they get it, you see the smiles. They emote that energy of, I feel good. I like this, right? So we can learn a lot about being emotive. Adults are kind of good at hiding their feelings or suppressing them or kind of pushing them to the side because we're professionals, right? We need to get this done. You should be able to say, yeah, I did it, right? Or this was awesome and like fist pump or whatever it is that you do to celebrate that emotion. So this is really huge and the cognitive parts of your brain um, without getting into too much of the brain science. If you haven't heard of Barbara Oakley, check her out because she explains the brain science of learning. Um, but learning with emotions instead of against emotions. First and foremost, I'll do the negative. We know for a fact, and hopefully, hopefully you've seen this too, when you or your child or the children around you, they're stressed or you're stressed. Learning does not happen. It physically cannot happen because your body, your brain was built to shut off and only focus on what is causing you anxiety or stress. Therefore, you have to acknowledge this stress. You have to acknowledge what is the, what is the thing that makes you want to slam your, your Y-A-M-L? Yeah, yeah, yelling at my laptop. Yeah, yeah that. Yeah. You Yaml. have to acknowledge that because at that point of time, you're not learning. So emotions are the key to making that knowledge permanent. Understanding the roles of each emotion, um, learning what to do with them, how to react with them, it's really helpful. And there's strong evidence for the um, neuroscience behind it. There's these feel-good hormones that happen and get released. It's um, oxytocin, dopamine, and another norepinephrine. I can't I've say I've only that read one. it, norepinephrine, <laughs> not, I, I don't know. That one, but it's mostly <laughs> dopamine, which is the one that gets released, and it's that having fun moment that makes you remember. And we're not saying, oh, go eat a piece of chocolate and you know, enjoy your ice cream or your coffee, and that's gonna help you learn. You actually have to feel that emotive side, that happiness, in order to trigger the dopamine to remember. 
and stay away from that stress because that cortisol, that stuff that gets you, puts a stop to that process of going from your short term to your long term and making those myelin connections. Okay. So how do you hack this, right? So how do you make your learning more effective? The first thing to do is to chunk your learning into smaller pieces. That way you shorten that reward cycle and you get more frequent hits of dopamine when you are successful at completing something. And you've seen this probably a lot with the you know, style of coding. If you're sitting there for hours trying to figure something out and you don't get up and you don't move and you don't um, you know, have something that is the end of that phase, you get more and more tired, more and more stressed, your shoulders hunch up, you kind of bend in inwards, right? But if you can break your learning into small chunks, the Pomodoro method works really well here. Learn for 20 minutes, take a five minute break. That way you force yourself to chunk that learning and you reward your brain for doing something really well, right? Um, you, also wanna, you also wanna create intrinsic reward systems, right? So the difference between an intrinsic reward versus an extrinsic reward, an extrinsic reward is I did awesome, I'm gonna eat a piece of chocolate, right? An intrinsic reward is I did something great, I'm going to post that on Twitter and share it with everyone because I'm really happy about it. So the extrinsic reward is something that you give yourself and kind of replaces those hormones versus the intrinsic reward is something that makes you feel good from the inside and rewards those hormones, okay? And then the other thing to do, especially as you start to chunk this learning, is to check in on your emotional state. Not just the learning that you've accomplished, but how are you feeling right now? How do you feel about what you just did? And I know that this sounds touchy-feely maybe or kind of soft and fuzzy, but it's actually really important because as Kelly talked about, if you're feeling stressed and you're not acknowledging that, if you're not recognizing it, it means that you're going to continue to feel stressed and continue to block the learning from actually happening. Whereas if you're feeling good about things, you wanna extend that feeling as much as you can because it's actually helping that what you're learning become long-term knowledge. And I'm gonna let you do this one too, because. This one's my favorite. 12 year olds take risks in their learning, intellectual risks, okay? One of the last things you develop cognitively in your brain as you become an adult is your sense of risk and reward calculations, right? 12 year olds it's measured have a pretty poor or in some cases completely absent sense of risk and reward. But this is actually an evolutionary trait that's really important because removing that risk reward as long as they're protected and in a safe place allows them to learn faster, more creatively and make connections that we as adults maybe inhibit, right? And so as an adult about 20% of you, the cells in your brain are there to inhibit risk-taking behaviors, to keep you alive and safe and all of those things. But in kids, that doesn't exist. So there's not that stop gap to say, mm, maybe this isn't such a good idea. You mean teachers and students know not to fly drones indoors? We do now. Yeah. Almost hit me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> but he learned not to use that button again <laughs> really quick. All right. so. Learning Python with courage. This is something that I personally took in for myself. Four years ago, my boss told me, about, you know, I'm a biology major, yes, I did robotics a lot, said to me, guess what, I need you to teach Python. And I looked at her and I said, I've never had a coding class in my entire life. Don't worry, you can do it. And I took this intellectual risk. I had to learn Python in three months before I taught it to sixth and seventh graders. It was a horrible first quarter, I'm not gonna lie. But the amount of learning that I did in that time was great. This intellectual risk that, w that kids, we put kids into, allows them to build this confidence and to make this creative, you know, make all these creative things. The best thing that I love about teaching middle school students is that they come up with the things that I believe, because of my constraints, can't work. And they prove to me that they can. You just have to have this creativity to go with the things that you believe in. And this is not the same as being fearless. It's not the same as launching a whole bunch of drones in a classroom. But it is a reward. There's still that dopamine release. When you take an intellectual risk and you are successful, or you take an intellectual risk and you fail, 
but you learn something from that failure. I'm not saying that the intellectual risk with failure is bad at all, because as long as you're taking that risk, that dopamine will still come out as long as you keep the stress under cover. And you gain more learning and memory faster. Okay. So the important thing for your learning as an adult is to create spaces where you can take that risk, right? So maybe you're not ready to take a risk in front of your colleagues, your coworkers, your partner or spouse or whoever that you care about most, but maybe you can create a space where you can take risks where other people don't see it unless you want them to, or create a space where there's people that you trust that you can work with, right? So for example, you know, if you're a web developer, try adding some data science. It, try learning some electronics. Try learning the piano, right? Try learning something that you don't know, okay? Another big risk, try teaching someone else, right? Like Kelly, I hadn't coded in Python even though I had you know, formal education, I hadn't coded in Python. I had to learn that in order to teach it. That's a lot of risk to your ego when you have to get up in front of a room of kids and say, here's what I think we're gonna do, and it probably goes wrong, but we learn, okay? Or, like we said with earlier with uh, trying to find a worse way of doing things, try building something or making something that you're pretty sure is gonna fail, right? Because in the event that it actually works, the reward is huge, right? So don't always take the safe bet. Try something new. Try something big and meaty and wild and see what happens, okay? And the risk for us as adults is we don't want to feel like we're silly or stupid or that we don't get it. And the reality is, is we all feel that way sometimes. Imposter syndrome is a real thing. But everyone here wants you to succeed. We want you to be successful, right? And only, you know, only some people really take displeasure in other people's failures. I don't know who they are. I don't know either. Okay. But I like this quote, and I'm going to say it. Picasso, he uh, says, I always seek out the things I cannot do so that I may learn to do them. And if you take on that challenge in, in learning Python and learning library, and writing PyScript, because I really want that in my school soon, so some people out there helping PyScript, go take a risk. Right. And if we can do it, you can too. Four years ago, I had never taught a class in my life, and I've taught hundreds of students now. Kelly had never written a line of code in her life. Thousands now. Yeah. Millions. And she teaches, she teaches the intro to Python, the beginning steps, way better than I do now. She's amazing, <laughs> right? Because she was willing to take the risk. Thank you. All right, so this is probably my favorite part about brain science, is this whole meta and this metacognition activity. Sean and I did this after every quarter. I still call him on, the, you know, on FaceTime and I need to meta out this activity that's not working. And it's this process of reflection. Again, the more times that you're passing from your short term to your long term, memory, this myelin wraps around your, your neuron and it makes that memory, that learning stick. The more myelin the have, the more myelin you have, the more opportunities to find connections. So this meta part, this reflecting, is a process of learning. So we always like to ask our students, what is it that you learned today? Or what do you think about your learning today? Or what didn't you know before today? Or where are you going to go after today? It's this opportunity to, to sort through all the experiences and identify what makes it important to you. Remember, we're looking for that dopamine. We're looking for that connection. And it's kind of like today, we apply this to our presentation. We meted it out forever. Yeah. So think about it this way. As you've been sitting here, there have been times when you've been checked out, right? There have been times when you like went and looked at your Twitter feed or you're like your mind drifted off into something else. What were those times when that happened? Which parts of the presentation were less interesting to you? What other parts when you were on Twitter did you go, oh, wait, wait, what did they just say? Like, I want to hear more about that, right? So this reflective process is really important because if we start to think about the way we learn, right, we can become more effective learners. And so you can apply this not just to the presentations you see here at PyCon, but say that YouTube video that you're watching, the tutorial, which parts of the, the web page am I skimming past in the documentation because I, I can't access it. Start to think about how you're learning and what things are working really, really well and which things are maybe not as effective and making your mind drift and wander. 
I'm going to add in real quick something that we started doing is the start, stop, and continue. What Sean brought in from, from the business world is something of what am I going to start doing, what am I going to stop doing, and what can I continue to do in my learning with Python. So maybe I'm going to stop uh, doing turtle Python because that's what my kids love and I'm really getting really good at Python turtle, um, and start doing something else, maybe like request. Or I'm going to continue doing um, simple apps and making music. With, with Python code because that's really working for the kids. So yeah. start, stop, and continue. And we're, you know, we're on track to finish a couple minutes early. So before, when we stop, but before you get up from your chair, we want you to ask yourself these questions. What can I start doing? What will I stop doing? And how will I, where will I go next in my learning? Okay, so don't just get up right away. Take a minute and just think about it for a second. Close your eyes and think. And then write it down or do something with it, okay? And so now our challenge to you, go out and learn something that scares you a bit, okay? Like shark wrestling or public Python. speaking, public speak. <laughs> right? My hands aren't shaking anymore. Oh, I'm that's saying. good. I'm all that's good. good. <laughs> um, and then add reflections to your learning process. Be more aware and more mindful of the way that you're learning new things. And then start to hack that process. Start looking at ways that you can make it better, more effective, cut out the parts that don't work, try something new in your learning process, make it really great. Yeah, and then to the younger people out there, I challenge you to talk to your parents and let them know how you're learning. Ask them questions. Ask them why things happen, because even if they don't know why something is working the way they are, you can go search it up, and you can learn more through that process. So then once you've done all that, email us. <laughs> tell us about it. We're on Twitter. We have our weekly podcast, bi-weekly every month, depending on how I'm feeling, we'll see. But you can listen to all of our back catalog at uh, teachingpython.fm. We've got a whole range of experiences, some really amazing guests that have taught us so much and we've learned so much from. Mm -hmm. And we can't wait to hear from you. So for Teaching Python, this is Sean. This is Kelly, signing off. All right, thank you everyone. <laughs>